gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Artist Heart Live, all the way from sort of sunny Scotland. It's kind of drizzly at the moment. 
it because uh, we're living in the Almenia. But anyway, more about that later. I am your host, John Morris, and welcome to the only show that is packed solid full of electric energy from the start of the show to the end of the show as we seek to entertain you and make your day that little bit brighter. And thank you so much for joining me once more. And we thank you so much again, as always, for liking, sharing, and subscribing, telling your friends, because it's the thing that just brings them a smile and wakes them up and brings them to life. In this week's show, we have got another exclusive awesome artist bio for you. I think you're going to love the artists that we've selected for this week's show. We're also going to be stepping in our Wayback Machine um, as we present to you another exclusive speed painting that you can only see on these shows. And talking of stepping back in our Wayback Machine, I really hope you enjoyed my little video presentation of uh, Guardian Angel, which was my own song and composition written, performed for my third CD. Yes, I was also a musician that performed CDs or produce CDs, um, back in 2017. And let me sh assure you, my friends, that that video that you saw with all the snow falling down, that was as real as real could be. Trust me, it was about minus four filming that in, I, I think it was like March or April, whenever it was. It was cold! That's why when you see me strumming the guitar, my hand can barely move anymore because it's literally frozen solid. So I hope you really enjoyed that and really appreciated that. Our world is in a really, really interesting state right now, as it always has been, but it's always interesting because it's us that are living through it. So let's turn now, as always as we do, to the best bits as we look at this week's funny news. This week we have had, and we want to thank Sky News for putting this out there for us, um, this week a Gree bin, a wheelie bin, uh, made its way all the way to the Ukraine uh, from Hampshire, which is a little place all the way in England. Now, this is this is quite an interesting story, and I and I really just just burst out laughing when I read this. A, a wheelie bin found its way all the way to the Ukraine. When it was reported, um, a, a gentleman had said, "Well, it was actually Mr. Crowther." Asked the council, "How did one of your wheelie bins make it all the way to the Ukraine?" And sarcastically. When is its pickup? To which the the person responding obviously said, um, Philip, uh, I, I, I've checked the notebook, but we don't seem to have any stock answers for this query. To which uh, Mr. Philip, I'm assuming, um, said, can I ask where in the Ukraine that is? I'd just like to make sure that this collection is not added to our fortnightly rounds and not reported as missing. I don't really think that the commute to the Ukraine and back is going to be on a on a high priority list, given the fact that a lot of the bin men don't like picking up from the local areas. Anyway, when we're talking about these crazy things that are going on, I would be remiss if I did not tell you about the next piece of news, which is about a cricket ball that lands in a beer. A ball at the cricket versus New Zealand cricket game landed in the spectator's drink. So let's pull this video up so you can Down see for yourself. Fellow in front gets out of the way, straight in there, straight in the pint, thank you very much. <laughs> Matt Potts, he explains that that's where it's gone, that's what's happened. Well, what now, is all this that's going on? Is he saying, can you throw Mark me the drink? Down the wheel. A little bit off Thirsty? the hand, off the other hand, and but then into the basket. Fellow in front gets out of the way, oh, straight in there, before. straight in the pint, thank you Luke. very much. Matt Potts, he Rather explains that that's where it's gone. Yep, he's being safe, he's happy, he's happy. Oh, he's going to look at my history. Butcher was sniffing at the bottom. So the first one was called by a bloke who doesn't know the cost of a pint. The second one by Mark Richardson was hit by a bloke who has no idea about the cost of a pint. Rather than a slam dunk. Not recommended that. Well, Freddie doesn't do that anymore nowadays. And Mark Butcher was sniffing it as well. Now it appears to be that cricket players are sort of rebelling and no longer want to catch cricket balls and do their job. And now they're asking the fans and the audience to do it for them. In other news, we want to take you now to something really, really amazing. As the stars are aligned for Mr. Dibbon, who is a man who is absolutely terrified of heights, and apparently he is going to attempt to uh, break the world record of bungee jumping. Uh, more him than me, but we certainly send him our best wishes. I can only imagine that uh, Mr. Dibbon, when he got out there on the platform, it was almost like brown trousers time. And talk about brown trousers time. Imagine going into a toilet, being a child in school, going into a toilet and discovering a puma. Apparently this big cat was found during a football match uh, by a boy taking a break and was later relocated to a forest without anyone being interest, uh, injured. Interested? Injured. 
But if you want to talk about something interesting, folks, the world's largest Jaffa kick weighing in over 80 kilograms and nearly two meters wide is created by one of the winners of the Great British Bake Off. And as you can see here, I mean, my goodness, to, to get the statistics here, folks, um, this Jaffa cake is the equivalent of 6,557 regular sized Jaffa cakes and measures 175 centimeters in diameter. And as you can see here, it is a beast of a Jaffa cake. Anyone with diabetes, colitis, Crohn's disease, or any form of other autoimmune disease um, that is, uh, you know, made worse by um, ingestion of chocolate-related products should look away now. Um, just the look of that alone, I think, is enough to send an anybody into anaphylactic shock. And that is the news this week, folks. As we always say, we want to see the lighter side of the news, and that is what we provide on this particular show on the artist heart live with that in mind now folks i want to take you in our wayback machine as i share with you one of my really really cool awesome and very very special custom painting orders all the way back from 2016 so sit back and enjoy and i'll see you really soon well hi folks and welcome to today's show it's great to have you here with us wherever and whenever you are watching this in the world in today's show i want to cover a topic with you that i get asked countless amount of times in any given week and it's how do you build and paint an eye now that might sound like a really strange question but for a lot of people it is actually a source of struggle now eyes are usually built up of three or four different elements and i want to cover those in depth and detail with you so now. beside me here what we've got is a cat pet portrait painting. Now, as I said, you know, eyes are pretty much built up of the same thing. You've got the white of the eye, you've got the iris, and you've got the pupil. But the fourth element is something that a lot of people forget, especially when they're portrait painting, and it is the tiny white dot of reflection. Well, I'm going to show you how to put all of those things in in this episode. So come on in. Right, folks, well, what we've got done here already is the colour of the eye. Now, this eye in particular was more of a sort of a yellow ochre brown colour. And we've basically just taken a little liner brush and we've worked around that area. Now, in order to get this correct, it's really, really important to understand your eye shapes. And what I would recommend in learning eye shapes is have a look on Google, okay? Type in, uh, I suppose, eye shapes, I suppose. Um, or painting eye shapes, Google will come up with a ton of different images that you can actually look through and learn and study all the different eye shapes. You've got rugby ball eyes, you've got sometimes more of a square eye, you've got all sorts of different shapes as well. And it's important to know which one you're painting for your specific portrait. Okay, so we've got the colour of the eye all painted in. Now what we're going to come in with, with our little liner brush, is a little bit of black paint. Now, in the photo, the eyes were basically no more than slits, so we're just going to come in with a little bit of black paint, small little shape just in there, and small shape over here. Okay, and this is painting in the black of the eye, so this is stage number two. Try and do it really carefully, there we go. That's one of the, the funny things, I prefer cats that have the big round eyes as opposed to these little slits. It's, uh, it's a little bit more uncomfortable. But, so there you go. So this stage number this two. this cat doesn't have any white around the surface of the eye, so I'm actually gonna put a little bit in just for portrait painting. Uh, sometimes it helps break things up a little bit more and it helps it be a little bit more realistic. I often find just adding a little bit of white just around the corners. Okay, then we're gonna come in with a little bit more white paint. And it's a tiny little white dot that we're just gonna place at the corners of the eyes. So we're just gonna come in a little bit of white paint. Here we go. Just touch it in there. And just something like that. And that's how eyes are really built. And that takes you from An artist being... that can do eyes okay to an artist that actually can make eyes look realistic. Okay, so that's going to be today's show, folks. I hope this has helped. I hope you found it very beneficial and very, very informative. Um, if you would like to see the end of this painting, we're actually going to stick this on for you now. But if not, have a lovely week. Take care. God bless. As always, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check us out at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com forward slash art tips with John. Um, 
where you can get all the latest news tips and all sorts of other stuff that you don't necessarily get on YouTube. Um, but we're going to put this together and we're going to continue painting in speed form so the video won't be too long. And uh, as I say, until next week, I have been your host, John Morris. Any questions you've got for me, as always, fire them to my, I'll, I'll try that again, fire them my way <laughs> on, uh, on the box below. And, uh, and I'll catch you next week. Take care. Reality. We all have to live in it. It's made of real things like trees and staplers and washing up. All very useful, but also just a tiny bit boring. Which is why the world needs surrealism. So, what is surrealism? Surrealism is an art movement started by French writer André Breton back in the 1920s. He was interested in things like dreams, fantasies and thoughts in our minds that we don't even know we're having. Artists such as Salvador Dali, René Magritte, Dorothea Tanning and Eileen Agar explored these ideas by creating surrealist art. So what does surrealism look like? There are two main types of surrealist art. The first type is inspired by dreams, like this piece by Spanish artist Salvador Dali. Dali was the big name in surrealism, known for his wild behaviour and even wilder art. Like dreams, his work often combines things you wouldn't expect to see together, like this piece. But hey, dreams can be frightening. Just look at this nightmarish painting by the American artist Dorothea Tanning. Surreal, huh? The second type of surrealism is called automatism, which is art made without thinking. So if you've ever doodled whilst daydreaming, I hate to break it to you, but you're a surrealist. Check out this playful piece of automatism by the Spanish artist Jean Miro. Is this the sort of thing you doodle? How did people react to surrealism? The surrealists were brilliant at promoting their work, Dali especially, who wowed the huge crowds at their London exhibition by showing up in full diving gear but most critics gave the show absolutely rubbish reviews. What does surrealism influence today? Nowadays you'll see surrealism's influence everywhere, from wacky adverts to video games to surreal scenes in comic book films. Anything that tries to break free of plain old reality with a little wildness, weirdness and joy. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that, my friends. I hope you did indeed. It was a tremendous amount of fun to put together. And wasn't that an incredible bio for sure? Moving on, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we are now living in the El Nino, um, or the El Nino, whatever you want to call it. El Nino, Almina, whatever it is. I don't particularly understand it myself. We're going to turn now to the Met Office, who can explain this a little bit better than I can. It influences weather patterns across the world, from America to Antarctica, to Australia. From the Spanish for little boy, it's known as El Nino. Its other cycle is La Nina, or little girl, with the in-between phase called neutral. The swing between these phases forms the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, one of the most important climate drivers in the world. ENSO is a major influence on Australia's climate. El Nino and La Nina events can cause natural extreme events such as bushfires, drought, heat waves, floods and cyclones. As the Earth spins, trade winds stream across the planet, driving warm surface seawaters across the vast Pacific Ocean. These sea surface temperatures create predictable patterns of circulation in the atmosphere and ocean. Climate scientists gather data from ships, weather stations, ocean robots and satellites to measure the swing between the three phases of ENSO – neutral, El Niño and La Niña. 
a La Nina event tends to bring above-average rainfall to eastern Australia. During an El Nino event, there is a greater chance of drought and bushfires. Each El Nino and La Nina event lasts about 6 to 12 months. It takes, on average, four years to cycle from El Nino to La Nina and back again. But no two El Ninos are the same. The strong 1997-98 El Nino impacted every continent in the world, causing widespread devastation worldwide. This story begins in the eastern Pacific. Here, trade winds blowing from east to west push warm surface waters across the planet, piling up warm water in the western Pacific. Above the ocean, warm air rises, driving atmospheric circulation patterns known as Walker circulation. Cold, nutrient-rich waters upwell in the coastal ocean, replacing the warm water pushed away by the trade winds. Like an athlete pumping iron, the La Nina is the muscled-up version of the neutral phase. Trade winds become strong, and more warm water builds up in the West Pacific. The excess of warm water increases evaporation and precipitation, causing floods and forming tropical cyclones off the northeastern Australian coast. This warm water escapes through the gap between Indonesia and Australia to supercharge the Lewin Current. A 5,500 kilometre long flow of warm waters along the western Australian coast. But, like an athlete, the winds can't keep pumping at this speed forever. Sometimes the winds weaken and warm water sloshes back across the ocean to the East Pacific. The Walker circulation breaks down, weakening or even reversing the trade winds. Warming of the East and Pacific accelerates, setting off a feedback loop that keeps most of the rain-producing evaporation in the middle of the Pacific. Due to the movement to the east of warm surface waters, northern and eastern Australia experience clearer skies, higher temperatures, heat waves and increased risk of drought. Off the coast, fewer tropical cyclones form as tropical activity is concentrated further east. Off the coast of South America, upwelling of cold waters is suppressed and warmer surface waters result in higher than normal rainfalls and sometimes flooding and hurricanes. In Western Australia, the Lewin Current tends to be weaker and cooler during El Nino events. During the 2010-2011 La Nina, marine waters that were up to five degrees warmer than usual caused mass deaths of marine life, as well as coral bleaching along the Western Australian coast. However, Warmer La Nina waters are generally beneficial for species such as the western rock lobster, whose larvae ride the Lewin current southwards. In La Nina years, more lobster larvae settle to the ocean floor, meaning greater numbers are available to fisheries. 2015 is the first strong El Nino in 18 years. In the future, understanding when, how and why these events happen will help us to manage the risks that they bring. And there you have it. So hopefully that's a little bit clearer to you folks. What I can understand uh, from all of that is, you know, basically it means that we're going to have much milder uh, temperatures, both in winter and much hotter summers as well. And I don't know about you, you know, Scotland, you know, I know contrary to popular belief, but Scotland does get actually uh, quite some of the highest temperatures in all of Europe, um, um, historically. Uh, so yeah, it, it is an interesting time for sure. And like I said, you know, at the beginning of this segment, you know, it is all about you know, balance. Our, our lives and everything operate on a very delicate system of balance. And we talk about that in our Wednesday show, The Battles We All Face, which is much more of a deeper, meditative, spiritual aspect of our network. So folks, as always, we hope you've really enjoyed this show. And if you have, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Tell a friend because it could be the very thing that they need to hear at the time or that they need to hear it. And until next time, take care. God bless. You can support us on Patreon, of course. And the link is in the section below. You can also check out uh, my books, uh, The Battles We All Face. And I've got a brand new one which I'm working on, but that doesn't come out till November. I'll tell you more about that nearer the time. Um, but also... 
Uh, you can check out paintings, you can check out prints, you can check out all manner of other artistic and wonderful exploits that are going on and explorations that are happening all over the place and so much more just by clicking the links below. And until next time, take care, God bless my friends, have an amazing week and I will see you same place, same time next week for another exciting episode of the Artist Heart Live. Catch you soon. Take care.